This is an oral history interview with Imam Furqan Muhammad, conducted by Khalil Abdullah on Wednesday, January 30th, 2013, at Masjid al-Mu'minun, on the subject of the early African-American Muslim community in Atlanta. Uh, Brother Imam, uh, assalamu Wa alaikum as uh, Did you grow up in Atlanta, uh, and if so, uh, when and in what community, what area of Atlanta? Yes. Uh, I ask Allah always to guide my tongue, my words, my mind, and bless me only to say those things that I need. Uh, I'm a native of Atlanta, born and raised in Atlanta, as many people say, a Grady baby. But I was raised up in what we call South Atlanta, which is not far from here, and near Carver Home. I went to Price High School. And uh, I've traveled throughout the United States, but I love Atlanta, especially for African Americans. I think it's a great city for African Americans. When, when were you born? I was born May 24, 1952. 1952. And, and, and did you, you said you lived, you traveled different places. Did you ever move away? From Atlanta and living in Atlanta? I, I, the furthest I moved was in Griffin, Georgia, which mm -hmm. is 40 miles south of here. Can you tell me about that time, why you moved? Uh, there was 1975, October, and I moved to Griffin, Georgia to become the imam there. And at that time, there had never been a masjid or mosque or Islamic center in, in Griffin. Mm -hmm. And we established the first masjid on uh, 9th Street which was an abandoned church. Uh, today that massacre is 315 North 3rd Street. But my whole purpose was to move there and to establish Islam. Mm -hmm. And that community still exists today. Mm -hmm. When did you move back to Atlanta? Probably 1982, maybe 83. Mm -hmm. And what prompted that return? Uh, I had a conversation with Imam Muhammad concerning my financial status and the taking care of my family. So he asked me the question, can you move back to Atlanta since you're from there? Do you think you would fare better financially? And just put before the believer, can you continue to be the imam? Mm -hmm. So though I moved back to Atlanta, I continue to be an imam right there in Griffin, mm -hmm. just going back and forth. Mm -hmm. So like an 80 mile round trip. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Backing up a little bit, how did you come to embrace Islam and when? Uh, I accepted Islam August the 5th, 1968. Uh, I was raised up in the church, six sisters, three brothers. My mother was Baptist, my father was Methodist, but all the children was Baptist. And I had problem with the images on the Sunday school cards. Everybody on the Sunday school card was white. I began to be inquisitive and that caused problem in the church. I like disturbing the peace of the church. Mm -hmm. And one day, I used to spend a lot of my time at the YMCA, because mm -hmm. I was into anything physical. I really believe that era saved me from drugs and stuff, because mm -hmm. I was into lifting weight, martial art, swimming, anything physical. And the Y offered all of that. This is the one on Butler Street, YMCA. There used to be, I don't, I don't know if it's still there today. And at the YMCA, there was people who were single men that rented there. They had rooms at the Y. Mm -hmm. And some of these people was Muslim. Mm -hmm. And I'm observing them, and I'm, at, I, I'm too afraid to ask them. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking other peoples about them. Man, what the peoples about? I mean, what kind of religion they got? Man, those peoples are Muslim. Man, this, they, they would kill you. You try to, you join that and try to get out of it, they would kill you, man. Mm -hmm. So that didn't, that didn't fit right with me. So one day I got the nerve to ask one of them about what you believe in and what have you. Mm -hmm. And the conversation was so inspiring to me because this person I'm talking to has no leadership in the religion, just a common person. So in my mind I'm saying if the common man is this heavy, mm -hmm. I would hate to meet that minister or that leader. Mm -hmm. So I was impressed. So I took it a, a step further. When do you all meet? So he told me when they meet and told me where they meet. And I went to a meeting with a set mindset, and it was totally different than what I expected. 
And it was so inspiring to me. It was at night when I went. When I went home, I couldn't even go to sleep. So I'm asking my mother, what do you know about Muslim? And what do you know about Islam? Asking my father, what do you... And they acknowledge that they didn't know much but to stay away from those people. They know good. And I told them that I went to a meeting last night. And it's totally different than what you all just said. They're very nice people. They're very intelligent. Mm -hmm. And they really got my attention. How old were you now? I was 15. And I embraced Islam when I was 16. When I left that night, I didn't know whether I wanted to be a Muslim. But I took an assessment of my Christianity and my practice of what I was claiming. And what I seen was in my own self, I was a hypocrite to what I already profess. So I began to re-examine the, the Christianity as I was taught my particular church, my particular minister, and all of the people who went to my church. And could, tried to go continually to the church. But I found it was very difficult after hearing the teaching and trying to share with others are you causing problems? You from Satan? You the devil? So then I took a neutral position. I have no religion. I don't claim no religion now. And I began to study and read Bible, Quran, and other books. One day it was raining. It was raining very hard. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be a Muslim. That night I said that. Mm -hmm. I went back not to listen to any more teachings. But even though I did listen to some more teaching, I went back with a mind saying, this is the day I'm going to become Muslim. And I accepted Islam. And one of the things that I experienced was I thought many people would be proud of me. And they rejected me. I'm telling people I don't do this anymore. And I expect them to go clapping, congratulating, and they look at me like, you've been brainwashed. You're not going to do what anymore? You're not going to do that no more? And I don't eat pork anymore? Come on, man, you're raised on pork. You, you referred to to first meeting uh, some Muslims at the Y. Yes. Uh, and the, and, and the, the overall perception was, you know, if, if you join them, they're going to kill you. Or they, yeah. Have you thought about what might have contributed at that time to, to kind of the public? Well, uh, well what, what happened, uh, that feeling, even that mentality still exists. You would think it would be erased. It don't believe in God, anti-Christ, violent. Uh, once you get in, you can't get out. You try to get out there, kill you. Because I think one aspect that the people have realized that to be a Muslim do not mean you're non-violent, that you will fight under certain principles. So some people have only seen the aspect where we fought. And then that made them arrive at the concept where evidently that's a violent mm. religion. Mm. So what was it about Islam that appealed to you? Well, remember at this time, this is the late 60s, mm. and I'm looking at everything that's beautiful and nice, white people own it. And I'm looking at African America who have achieved so much, but the bottom line, you're still black. You know, you, you can't wake up one morning and you're white, you're still black, but all your uh, wealth and your popularity, you're still black. And when I heard the concept, do for self, that if you want to be equal to the white man, you got to do what he do. Mm -hmm. So these concepts set in my soul, it's like, yeah, man, that's right. And that concept stayed with me about doing for yourself, being united, having good morals, that attracted me. So it was the discipline, it was the unity, and it was the uniqueness of black people doing things totally independent of white people. Where did you accept Islam? And are you, are you what you just described, does that describe accurately kind of the community that you, you were in at that time, okay. in the late 60s, early 70s? I came in at 1225 Bankhead Highway. This is, and that was temple number 15 under the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. The hygiene, the neatness, the clean dress, because it was attacking everything that people were saying about black people. Black people stink, they didn't stink. Black people are dirty, they weren't dirty. Black people are stupid, they're intelligent. So that, that, that's what sparked my attention. And they, they're the opposite. Everything they say about black people, they're the opposite. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, 
can you can you can you describe the community at that time? Can you talk about the leaders, the activities? Yes. What did it mean to be part of the, the temple or the Yeah, meeting? first of all, during that time we had zero tolerance for laziness and ignorance. If you was a lazy person, you became industrial. If you was a dumb person, you became a smart person. That, that was unacceptable. If you didn't have a job, then the, the nation taught you how to make yourself a job. Do not accept to be unemployed. And that's when you see brothers on the street selling incense, selling socks, selling handbags, whatever, but refuse to accept that I'm unemployed. Mm -hmm. uh, brothers had responsibility. When you became a part of that community, you was told this is what we expect out of you as a male. If you was a woman, this is what we expect out of you as a woman. So you want to meet that expectation, you want to do that. If you were told you're supposed to sell so many paper, you're supposed to be at so many meetings, you're supposed to bring so many guests out, you wanted to qualify to be that. And the unity was extremely thick and strong. I was raised in a unity house, and a unity house where you have three or four brothers living together, they're all single, they have no wife, they have no children, so they split the rent four ways. They spend the utility four way. They buying groceries four way. The economic was really something how we practice economic. Live well, but very simple and very low in price. And these four brothers, we could change tires, cufflinks, tie pins. Or people thought you had a big wardrobe, but you didn't have it because you just the love is so. That you gonna wear this tie today? No. Can I wear it today? And when we cook, there was no question about who this belonged to. If it's cooked, it belonged to all of us. Help yourself eat. eat. Help yourself. Was this something encouraged within the, within the nation of Islam? Yes. It was encouraged. In other words, it was always the concept, you can be up today and down tomorrow. So if I'm up now, I'm obligated to help you if you're down. And when I get down, now you're obligated to help me. In one case, we had a brother who had one automobile. And his concept was, when he got ready to leave the house, anyone going my way, be ready. You can ride. Or the day he didn't use the car, anyone want to use the car can use the car. And every time a brother got married, we gave him money to send him off and wish him well. So again, and we was always concerned about each other. If, if I was a brother that was home every day about 6 p.m., now it's 10 p.m., something is wrong. He's never out this late. So there was a loss of love and a loss of concern. And if a brother had a car, and he was a productive brother, and if they were going to repossess his car, we would take up a special collection because his car represents community life. If he lose that car, it's gonna hurt a whole bunch of us. If he keep that car, it's gonna help a lot of us. So again, everything would gear toward community. Mm -hmm. 